Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you v -v 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 vipers doing out there, Mrs. Weedman? Mr. Weedman? How the hell are you? Hanging in there. Hanging in there? It's one of those weeks. Are you about to hang high? I need to hang high? <laughs> I need, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, everybody out there in the world, hopefully you're smoking some big fat doinks while you're listening to the show. And Mrs. Weedman and I are about to get normal on Mr. Weedman strain that he just cut and put in some jars called Yeet. And this was grown by, uh, actually bred by Umami Seeds. And this is Yeet, Y-E-E-T. Mrs. Weedman, light that bowl up. All right. I don't have a lot of information on this. I could tell you the lineage. And it is Runts times Triangle Mints F2 times Yahemi. And I got this probably about four or five months ago or six months ago. I bought the strain. I finally got a chance to plant it. This was a really fun strain to grow, but also gave me a little trouble uh, along the way. And uh, meaning like, it was just a tough grow all around. I only grew one plant because they were feminized seeds, which was great, super easy. But just uh, uh, growing organic is not always easy. So I grew organically, and uh, it was tough, but it was fun. And I had and I had nice buds, a good yield off of one plant. Probably got about two and a half, three ounces dried, and. The toppers <laughs> were just so beautiful and purple. The leaves were very purpley underneath. The smell was very, very gassy, but the taste. It is very, very gassy. Yes, very gassy. But the taste on it, though, too, had very big pinene, <laughs> yes. I would say, and very, very lemony. Mm -hmm. is I was my... going to say citrus, lemon, gas front. Yes. Oh, like my that's... gosh. So good. The high, because we did smoke. I did pull a couple nugs along the way <laughs> while it was drying, and this is before I put in the jar secure. So within, like, the 15 days, I probably pulled the tw pulled little, 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 little mids off just to test it. I love doing that to see how it's developing in the drying phase and uh the first time we did it was so wet we couldn't even light the joint remember yeah. that yep. it was brutal and uh so we really think the second time though we did it out of the eight decades bowl and i was fucking baked <laughs> really baked <laughs> and uh so mrs wee man go ahead and talk for a minute while i light this eight decades bowl up and smoke some yeet yeet y'all yeah it, it was tasty definitely gassy um, my little plants, so I've got two autos growing outside. We, I say we because I really wanted to grow my first plants by myself. And Mr. Weedman is holding my hand. Not really. So he's walking me through. Well, you've been helping with, yeah. you prepare my water. Yes. Like, so he gets the pH levels right on the water that I need. He's been mixing my nutrients for it. Um, not a ton of nutrients. No. We've learned with the auto flower, the oh, auto seeds, you just don't need to add all of that. But they are the cutest little plants. If you watch Mr. Weedman's uh, Show Your Grow Fridays, Show Your Grow Fridays, I've been sending photos in. And these fat nugs, we think there's going to be some seeds in there because we had a male plant also across the yard. And we think. And we wanted to breed. Yeah. We wanted to breed it and see what we got some seeds out of it. So we did. We did toss, we did pollen chuck, as Big Earl always says, pollen chuck a little bit on some of uh, some of the plants. But also there was wind, there was wind uh, blowing a lot and probably blew some pollen over to that plant. So we think we're going to have a, a good amount of seeds coming from that coming too, from which there, we yeah. really wanted to try to breed too. So it was kind of fun when I, when I told but Big here Earl. here you go calling it the we. Sorry. It's a me. It's my, my plant. You. You've been consulting. <laughs> I have. Sorry. The consultant. I've been out there talking because I just learned this week, which I kind of already knew, but a scientist has discovered like they put plants into a different category now because plants respond not only to light and water and nutrients, but they also respond to touch and and sound you know people say they talk to their plants well i've been talking to these little beauties outside and i give them a little pat when i feed them i say you keep growing you cute little <laughs> things keep growing and you've been and i trim their their leaves so nicely and yes, i say i'm did. sorry but we gotta get this one out of the way so you could grow better i really talk you to got those. they're cute fat, they're like little monsters yeah, these plants you got they fat only fat buds yeah they only grew from the like the start of the leaves so there's like the the shaft of the plant is probably about four inches above the soil and then from that point to the top of the plant is maybe like 16, 18 inches. 
They're squatty, awesome little plants with probably four offshoots and just big, fat, nubby buds. Monsters. Oh my god, they're huge. Monsters. Yeah. Big Earls. You, it's I know fun. you've been you've been talking about Big Earl too, mm-hmm. like when you mm-hmm. should pull it and stuff like that too. Referencing what Big Earl was telling you about too. So yes, yeah, sorry, I'm saying we. It is your plant. You've been doing all the work. Well, I'm no, just, you've been, I've been helping. You've been consulting. I've been consulting and, and helping. advising. Yes, but I did take yeah. a little pollen and I just shook a little bit on the end of one. But I think we're gonna get a bunch of seeds. So we'll have to see what the coaxes look like. We were looking at them today a little bit, and it, they're fat. And Big Earl was telling me that it look at those and see if they're very plump. So there was a bunch of they're them that plump. were pretty plump. Yeah. So we're at, we're super stoked. It's our first little breeding session, growing session outdoors, and Mrs. Weedman has been doing a phenomenal job. And I've been doing a decent job consulting. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to trying this. And uh, it, I'm, I'm super stoked because uh, it comes from our good friend Big Earl. You know, which also some genetics from Hummingbird Hills, mm-hmm. uh, which is great, too. So it's that Ursula Berry mixed with, I can't remember uh, what the other mix was. But anyway, we're super stoked to get this grow. And the yeet is so pungently piney. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like it's mm-hmm. like being in a for, uh, a pine forest. That's yeah. what it, that's the taste. I mean, it's just so heavy pining. Um, and what I liked about the strain that when we smoked it the other night was it made me awake but it made my body very relaxed. And then all of a sudden I got sleepy and I was ready to go to sleep. <laughs> I could keep my eyes open. <laughs> so great strain. Thank you. We watched the last two episodes, seven and six of the righteous gemstones. Oh my gosh. What a show. Ms. Wee man. Yeah. We didn't even realize we were watching the season finale. No, it wasn't the oh, season wasn't. finale. No, this show only goes week to week. Oh, that's what it was. We had like was, seven episodes. We hadn't stoned. watched yet. So, cause we watched the bear first. Mm-hmm. So, so good, so good. They're crazy. They're, they're, they're absolutely nuts. nuts. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin anything. No, that's don't going even out go there. It. But oh my goodness, so if you funny. don't watch it, just watch it. Yes, just oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> when uh, my mom's coming in town, I call her Grandma Weed because she was born on four twenty, so she deserves that name. She's coming into town. We told her about it. She doesn't have Max, uh, which the show's on, so we're gonna rewatch it with her because it, you need to. It's that funny. So uh, <laughs> so when Grandma Weed comes in town this week, it's gonna be a great watching some shows with her and spending some time with Grandma Weed. Hopefully she eats an edible. She doesn't do much. She doesn't do much pot. She says very little, maybe but not at all. She's had edibles with us before. Yeah. Remember, she thought there was a stain on the floor, yes. and she kept what get, get that off the floor. Get it off the floor. <laughs> what she is that brain up. on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, she thought it was a brain, a brain or something. piece of a brain. So hopefully we get her to take some edibles with us here. So she doesn't do too much. She could use it though. I can just say that. So finally retired too, Grandma yeah. Weed. Retired. Fifty five years of work. Congratulations, Super Grandma Weed. We love you. Congratulations on retirement. If I know you listen to the first like 15, 20 minutes of the show, then you turn it off. You always tell us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Grandma Weed, happy retirement. Happy retirement. Yes. And then we went to, we mentioned this on the last episode, the Empire Strips back. It was amazing. Oh, if you're in Chicago or anywhere in the suburbs of, of Chicagoland area, you need to see this show, If you, especially if you're a Star Wars fan. Even or if, if you're, you're not, not a even Star like Wars a fan. If, if you've at least, like, you understand the premise or the character names. If you've seen, I've probably seen the Empire Strikes Back and the original Star Wars. The other ones I've probably seen bits and pieces, but I have not sat through it. And this production was fantastic. They nailed it. They nailed, they nailed it. every it aspect was, of it. So it's a burlesque show. Um, based on the characters of Star Wars. And so it is super sexy, obviously. It is amazing sets. It is amazing costumes, amazing lighting, music, the choreography, the dance. And like I, I, All I kept thinking while I was sitting there being completely enamored by the show, like cracking up, they had this the MC, he called himself the host, comical, funny, he knew how to like get the house kind of engaged and oh my god it was just great all i kept thinking is why is this only here in chicago for three weeks no one's gonna know about it in time like this everybody needs to see this it was a it was really cool it was so really especially being a a diehard star wars fan and i mean i'm a collector of of a certain group of star wars figures uh i have darth vader on my arm you know i've been i mean a tattoo a a tattoo yes and i I'm, i'm a huge nerd and when it comes to Star Wars, I went in there with an open mind, though, and not not knowing what to expect. I was excited that we were going to see. And when I walked into the theater and I saw the pictures on the walls, I'm like, OK, 
This, this is could dope. be cool. It was this the, is dope. They had um, old like vintage frames that would you normally see in an old theater that would have the movie like the um, the movie posters on them, yes. and then like a signed uh, autographed photograph of somebody. And it was pictures of the burlesque. But it was the, burlesque the characters people. in yes. this play in was, their in their costumes yes. and like sexy poses. It was very very. Cool. It was really cool. And uh, so I, I when when the host came out. He was a play on basically uh, he was he looked like Lando Calrissian when he came out and he made a joke going, I'm not Lando Calrissian. I'm his nephew, Devante. And <laughs> I am right. from the, cl- I I am from the cloud. I am from the cloud city, but we got some fucked up shit going on there right now. And that's how he started yeah, off. Yeah, and yeah. I was in. And then the first the first set when when the scene came on was the uh, was from Empire Strikes Back. When Luke was out in the cold and he froze and, and they killed the um, the uh, I can't remember the name of the thing. I'm stone. So anyway, the thing they cut it open and all the guts came out and he slid in and they did the whole scene sensually and elegantly. And I, I mean, and Polly, my son, who was with us and, and O dog, our daughter and their two partners were with us. And uh, I looked at Paul. and I said, this is going to be fucking awesome awesome mm-hmm. and he was like oh yeah and then they did the speeder from luke and they did like a, a car washing scene mm-hmm. sensual and fun and then they went i mean the job of the hut one was oh my God. fucking amazing oh, princess leia oh, was fantastic. The, oh my gosh and then they uh, did the who uh, are the women the the red the dresses 12, uh oh those are the, the uh, guards uh yeah the imperial, imperial guards. guards yes they were oh my good God, that was amazing the scene with r2d2 though oh yeah when when uh, the don't dancer, give it away. I, who cares if they don't? People might not see it. This ever see a, it? So it is a traveling show, so yes. it is going Phoenix, around. They're going to Phoenix next. Phoenix next. Yeah, they're going to Phoenix They've next. Been in New York, but from wait, Australia. hold on. Let me yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, the yeah. R2D2. Yeah. Go. The R2D2 was she came out with R2D2, and it was literally a real R2D2. It really was remote controlled somewhere. They, this thing was doing dances, and it was doing the cool little looks at her when she was when she was dancing. And all of a sudden, she got in front of him, and she twerked a big twerk. And all of a sudden, he made it. Uh, he, R2D2 made it rain out of his helmet. It was hysterical. It was just dollar dollar bills, y'all, coming out like great. crazy. And I was I went nuts. And his like his lights nuts. lit his up. Lights were all, oh my gosh! <laughs> He's spinning and around. And the light shows. The it was lights great. were unbelievable. I was amazed. It looked like you were in a nightclub. We got really high before the show oh, yeah. too, but oh, yeah. that, that had really, I mean, it, it of course elevates the experience, but it was just a great show, even if you weren't high. Yes. Oh you, my God. You need to go if, if you're not a Star Wars fan, or if you are a Star Wars fan. It was uh, two hours. It, full production. Two, full yeah. two hours. And then we went to a pizza place afterwards with O-Dog and her partner and then uh, Shoddy, the producer, and Polly and us. And we got to meet the two directors. They came and had pizza with us. Mm-hmm. because one, uh, uh, They've been hanging out there. Yeah, they've been hanging out there. And, and O-Dog's partner, uh, Amr Dave, he works there. And it was so awesome that they sat with us and we got to ask him questions and listen in and, and find out some things. And uh, it was awesome. And I didn't get to see stormtroopers with penises. I got to see stormtroopers uh, as women instead, and they were beautiful. And uh, <laughs> but I was hoping to see star- stormtroopers with penises, and I was kind of you were you were hoping I, I to th- see it. It was kind of funny. I thought you would see that. <laughs> the, the Han Solo dude in the Chewbacca right. dance was amazing. Yeah, that was too. He was dope as he was dope yeah. as fuck. I just thought it'd been funny right. to see stormtroopers with helmets on, walking with like around little with their speedos. Penises. Or yeah, something. it would have been great. Yeah. It would have been great. I just, that's what I wanted to see. I would have right. I would have laughed my ass off at it because it would have been great. It would have been like all soldiers lined up perfectly <laughs> <laughs> all heads so, in a row yeah so but please 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 if you could see it in the state or city it's coming to i highly yeah, look for it. recommend you go uh the uh two producers directors that sat with us um and had pizza they are from australia Both, i think yeah. the show originated yeah. in australia yeah so our friend Tez, Tez and for Turks and all for of it. our friends in, in Australia, if they, if they come out. back there, go see it. And I think I heard the, the director said she was from Perth. Oh, cool. Where I believe I think our our, our, our friend Tez is from. Yeah. So uh, so check it out, everybody. I, I highly recommend it. So you ready to get the show started, Ms. Wee Man? I'm ready. Let's do this. We've talked about the cannabinoid CBN on the show, but this is a good article about, done by Green State and... Uh, so wondering how much CBN can help you sleep, they say they have the answer. Today, 
we want to take a look at one of these specific potential benefits that CBN has to offer, which is that it could help you get a good night's sleep. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, CBN might just be the answer you've been looking for. Today, we want to take a much closer look at the CBN is and how to take it and how much you should take to sleep and more. I've been told and taught and learned that CBN, if you take too much, uh, it could possibly give you nightmares and give you an uncomfortable sleep if you take too much. So let's go into more. Uh, we will then also take a look at some of the best CBN products right now. I don't care about that. I won't give anybody plugs on products, but the best CBN for sleep can come from a form of gummies, tinctures, or other edibles and more. So let's find out. Key takeaways. CBN stands for cannabinoid, one of the minor cannabinoids found in hemp and cannabis plants. Although it is generally non-intoxicating for most people, it is believed that CBN has a number of possible benefits with aiding sleep uh, being one of them. What is CBN? CBN is one of the many minor cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant. For the record, THC and CBD are the major cannabinoids because they both occur in sizable quantities, usually anywhere between 10 and 30 percent. However, other cannabinoids such as CBN as well as about 100 others are known as minor cannabinoids. This is because they generally only occur in very small quantities, usually 1 percent or less. For this reason, CBN is quite rare and CBN products are somewhat hard to find. If you do find them, they can be rather expensive. For the record, CBN is a, a metabolite of THC. This means that THC breaks down usually due to sunlight and age, as well as exposure to oxygen. It breaks down into CBN. For this reason, plants that are much older, especially ones that have been left to dry and cure for a long time, tend to contain much more CBN in relation to THC, especially when compared to younger plants. I, I've talked about how I like to age some of my weed that I've grown and keep it for a little while because I do enjoy the CBN smoking it in flour, and I do enjoy it, so I do have some for, for nighttime sleep. So... Furthermore, another important note about CBN that is generally considered to be only mildly psychoactive and non-intoxicating for most people. It is thought that is uh, it is a fraction of the potency that THC is. This means that it generally does not produce any kind of high or intoxicating effects unless you consume very large quantities of it, but everyone is different. However, most people just don't get high from it. CBN is thought to have a wide variety of potential medical and therapeutic benefits, both physically and mentally, although today we are here to focus mainly on the sleep aspects. How do you take CBN? The good thing about CBN is that it's very easy to take. Some of the most popular consumption methods for CBN is include edibles and tinctures. Yes, a tincture is technically also a form of an edible. Although it's not really designed to taste great or be chewed like other foods, tinctures are cannabinoids that have been extracted from the plant matter and then can be infused into what is usually either alcohol or oil. Gummies, lollipops, and baked goods are more like the recreational side of CBN and other cannabinoid edibles, whereas tinctures and oils are more like the therapeutic side of the equation. Either way, ingesting CBN and other cannabinoids orally is the most popular method. With gummies and other such edibles, you chew and swallow them. This means that it can take anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes for them to take full effect. If you were talking about tinctures and oils, the preferred method here is sublingual application. This simply means you let it sit under your tongue for a few minutes before you swallow it. The mucous membranes in the lining of your tongue are very thin, which means the CBN is very quickly absorbed into your bloodstream. This allows the CBN to take effect much faster. However, you still end up swallowing it afterwards, so it still functions like a normal edible too. How much CBN for sleep is the proper dosage? The official recommendations for CBN doses for sleep are that you take anywhere between 3 and 6 milligrams of CBN for sleep. I've seen some some out there are 2 milligrams, 2.5 milligrams, so but that is that that 3 to 6 milligrams is a good dose. Uh, and it also depends on your metabolism. Unfortunately, everybody reacts different, at least as far as the dosage is concerned. So you might have to go through a bit of trial and error. The best CBN dose for, for sleep depends on the individual needs. I've met a person along my travels in, into the, the cannabis world and industry, and I met, a, I met a person who told me that they take up to 20 to 30 milligrams of CBN, and he said it's like a hallucinogenic, like he gets like he's on, on psilocybin, mushrooms. Wow. Yeah, when he loves it. I'm like, dude, you're out of your mind. He goes, I am. I love it. <laughs> How does CBN work for sleep? And also, I don't recommend anybody doing that. This is just this person telling me this. Uh, how does CBN work for sleep? So one common myth here is that CBN is a powerful sedative. There are plenty of articles out there that tell you that CBN is one of the most powerful sedating cannabinoids found in cannabis plant. Well, unfortunately, this is more or less just wrong. 
Although CBN may be able to help you sleep, it's not because it's sedative. It's not like THC, which quite literally makes you feel tired when you consume it. Rather, CBN helps you get a good night's sleep in other ways. First and foremost, CBN is thought to be able to help reduce symptoms associated with anxiety and depression, as well as stress, to a certain degree. Simply put, if you're anxious and stressed out, falling asleep becomes quite difficult. Yes, it does. When your mind doesn't shut off and you're stressed about work or you're stressed about your life, you're stressed about paying bills or you're anxious about something, maybe you have a job interview. Yes, that it, it is impo- it sucks trying to fall asleep when your mind is not right. Uh, furthermore, CBN also has the potential to relieve both pain and inflammation. However, that does not uh, that does work much better for sleep is a combination of CBD and CBN, as uh, we're going to learn more below. Can you take CBD and CBN together for sleep? Yes, you can take CBD and CBN together for sleep. In fact, this is what uh, what this article is recommend doing. The reason is. That for although CBN does not have a variety of potential benefits, actually sedating you or making you feel tired is not one of them. However, it may relieve feeling of anxiety and depression, plus it might be able to help you reduce some pain and inflammation. It just helps make you feel a bit more comfortable, both mentally and physically. Well, CBD can potentially do all these things too, including pain relief, inflammation relief, and anxiety and depression relief, among other things. Also, what this doesn't mention also is... THC. You can also take THC and CBN together also in the proper dosage. I my I like taking CBN and I usually do a 10 THC to 5 uh, or 2.5 or 3 CBN is kind of my dosage in, in my wheelhouse. Uh, CBD and CBN, which is better for sleep aid. We talked about CBN gummies versus oil for sleep. Two of the most popular forms of CBN to take are gummies and oils. The only major difference here is that oils can be put under your tongue for sublingual application, which means that they can enter your bloodstream and take effect a bit quicker than gummies. However, putting oil in your mouth is not overly enjoyable, and it doesn't always taste great. If you can wait an extra 30 minutes for the CBN to take effect, they personally recommend the gummies because they can actually be quite tasty depending on who they come from. Either way, it's really more a matter of peripheral preference than anything else. And conclusion, at the end of the day, CBN is something that may help you get a better night's sleep, especially when combined with other cannabinoids. Let's, um, I I mean, I take it, Mrs. Wee Man. Mm-hmm. You've taken yeah. THC gummies with CBN in it. We, yeah. I, I like them. I mean, I, I mean, and like I said, I do keep some of my weed a little bit longer and let some sit for a while, too. And I actually prefer the smoking. Uh, and if you can't smoke, I totally understand. But I prefer the smoking it a little bit better than anything else. That's just my personal preference. So, um, yeah. So that's about CBN. Big things going on right now in the cannabis industry, especially when it comes to cannabis beverages. There's, they're talking about it being a five, a two to five billion dollar market. Uh, people are, are are now switching from alcohol to cannabis beverages. It's a little bit more social. You, it's 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 becoming a thing. And it's become. I think it's going to become a big industry, especially when it becomes federally legalized and you can start selling it in bars. Oh, right yeah. now, you do go to some bars and you see CBD drinks and cocktails, but this is going to, I think, going to revolutionize the industry when it comes to going out. Yep. And and because when we had uh, the uh, people from Professor on and Maddie was talking about she feels bad for the, the, the bar industry because people aren't going to bars as much because they're staying at home and just smoking cannabis – and uh, she feels bad, but this can actually help the bars because we've seen people make some phenomenal THC mocktails. And I think and feel, and in my opinion, once it goes federally legal or the states start allowing it for bars to carry consumption, this is going to like help the bar and restaurant industry, nightclub industry, huge, huge. And especially if you could distribute it right directly to bars and sell it and sell cases of it wow i just had though like a an early thought of situations that'll happen is that people who are not super con super consumers like they don't regularly consume cannabis are going to think they can do this big wild night out of doing some shots and some drinks and some thc beverages and they're going to be freaking hammered because that's when you have too much to drink and too much to smoke or consume THC, 
it, it's not a good it's not a good feeling. It, no. It's it's great in the moment, but <laughs> yeah, it just here's it's the a thing. bad hangover. I mean, here's the thing. I think if you go out and you consume cannabis beverages, you should just stick with that. Right, but I'm just saying early in. Uh, I know you're that, gonna see some people green out. It, you're yeah. gonna see some people puking because yep. they're gonna be foolish and think they can handle both when you can't, um, because it catches up to you. Right, especially if you have. Say if they're only allowed to sell three milligram drinks. Sure. So you have you're not a consumer, and you have three of those on top of some beers right. or a couple you're glasses of wine. Be your life. You're not going to be real happy. No, not at all. <laughs> not at it's all. It's not pretty. Now I know I've been I've gone out and smoked weed and taken edibles and gone out and drank all yeah, night. Yeah, a couple of beers. Yeah, I've gone out and drank beers, a lot of beers. Oh yeah. But I monitor my cannabis consumption. If I know I'm going to have a, a drinking night of beers. I don't really do hard liquor. And uh but I know I'm going to go have 6 7 8 9 beers on a night out. I don't really drink like that anymore, but even when I did, I knew my limit on what I should do with cannabis and what I should do and and where to stay at level. Like I always here's the thing. I always smoked first before I drank. Hmm. Because if I was already buzzed and I went and smoked and it's happened to me, I can count on my both hands. It's happened to me at least 10 times in my life to where I drank first and was fucking stone and, and like stone cold drunk and went and smoked and ended up throwing up. Yeah. So I, I for me and my body, I always when I learned that I smoke first, then I know my limit on how much I can drink because I'm already there. Right. You but know? you figured that out the, for yourself. Right. And everybody's going to have to learn a lesson or two mm -hmm. along the way. Yep. It'll so be interesting. you're hearing it from Mr. and Mrs. Weed, man. Learn your lessons quick because it's gonna. <laughs> it sucks. Being hungover sucks. Throwing up and praying to the porcelain god all day. Yeah. Being and, and a lot of it has to do with being dehydrated. For every one or two beers I drink, I drink a glass of water. Alcohol dehydrates you. That's where the problems start. Then everything else is afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so remember that. Just a little tips, chicks, and, and tips from Mr. and Mrs. Weed Man. <laughs> so tell, tell us why swapping alcohol for cannabis beverages. Well, this uh, article comes from a Rebecca Strong, and it is, I swapped alcohol for cannabis beverages, and here's what I noticed. If I had to sum up my drinking habits over the last few years, the word I'd use is problematic-ish. They weren't talking... A noticeably negative they weren't taking a noticeably negative toll on my work uh relationships or health but i couldn't help wondering when did i start ending almost every work day with a glass of wine or two and why do i feel like i need that to relax given that alcoholism runs in my family i wanted to nip this nightly routine in the bud before it grew into a bigger problem so when I discovered cannabis beverages, which promised to take the edge off and offer a subtle buzz without the hangover, I decided to try substituting them for my daily pour of wine and see if I noticed any benefits to the switch. Studies repeatedly show that drinking surged during the pandemic in women by more than 40%. And along with that, alcohol-related deaths rose as well. Over time, excessive drinking can increase your risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, digestive problems, liver disease, depression, anxiety, and certain types of cancer, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. With recreational cannabis use now legalized in 23 states and counting, and an increasing number of weed-based beverages hitting the shelves, more and more people are swapping out their go-to beer, wine, or cocktail for a cannabis alternative. In fact... A 2020 Harris poll found that 45% of people who have ever used cannabis used it to reduce or replace their alcohol consumption during the pandemic. That's big. Yeah. On my quest to find a tasty wine substitute, I tried at least a dozen different cannabis drinks and found that three worked for me. Can, a line of canned social tonics made from all natural ingredients and only light and lightly sweetened with agave, makes several complex fruit and herb infused flavors, each of which has a modest two milligrams of THC. Levia also makes a water soluble tincture that allows me to get creative and cre my, create my own custom cannabis mocktails. And Good Stuff Beverage Company. They offer a line of ready to drink lemonades made with real pureed fruit and tropical blossom honey. They're delicious on their own or mixed with seltzer. As with the Levia tinct tincture, 
Good Stuff's products can be dosed according to my desired experience. In other words, I can use more or less depending on how much I want to feel the effects. So armed with my three new beverages to crack open when I need to unwind, I gave up my nightly glass of wine for one month to see if I felt any different. And here's what I noticed. My anxiety is lower in the morning. I've struggled with anxiety since my early 20s, and it's especially intense first thing in the morning. Alcohol can trigger uh, anxiety and worsen it, which can then drive you to drink more in an effort to feel calmer. On the other hand, studies have shown that low doses of cannabis can actually help to relieve anxiety, and I certainly found this to be true. After a few days of enjoying an evening cannabis beverage instead of wine, I began waking up without that stomach-churning, heart-racing feeling I had gotten so accustomed to. I'm sleeping more soundly. Sure, sipping on some Malbec at night can send me off into a dreamland in a snap, but the problem is I don't stay asleep. In fact, I tend to wake up frequently throughout the night and feel groggy the next day. That's because alcohol creates an imbalance in your sleep cycles, decreasing your overall sleep quality. The jury is still out whether cannabis hurts or helps sleep. Some studies have found that you can catch more Z's, while others have found it can have a negative effect. However, a 2021 review revealed promising findings that suggest cannabis may have therapeutic potential for a wide range of sleep disorders. Personally, I found I was able to sleep more soundly straight through the night, and as a result, I woke up feeling more well-rested and energized. My mild digestive issues mostly went away. Alcohol can actually make your stomach produce more acid than usual, which can wear away at your stomach lining and even cause painful inflammation over time. So it makes sense that cutting out alcohol helped to relieve unpleasant gastrointestinal symptoms. Cannabis can also relieve nausea. Some research has shown that cannabis may be effective in treating the symptoms of irritable bowel disease, like abdominal pain and cramping. Within less than a week of making the switch from wine to weed beverages, I personally found I had less nausea and heartburn after meals. My relationship conflicts are less frequent and fiery. Booze-fueled fights are the worst kind. Even small disagreements can spiral out into blowouts, causing you to say things that you don't mean and later regret. Ain't Cons- that the truth? Considering alcohol lowers your inhibitions, impairs your judgment, and affects the emotional center of your brain. My husband doesn't drink alcohol, and while my alcohol consumption is pretty moderate, I did wonder sometimes if drinking wine made me a little more feisty, defensive, and combative during our occasional arguments. It seemed to turn up the dial on my emotions. After a couple of drinks, something that might normally just irritate me felt like an infuriating offense. Emerging research is examining how cannabis may impact romantic relationships, and the findings thus far have been promising. Where alcohol use has been linked to aggressive and violent behavior, a 2014 study found that couples who use cannabis are significantly less likely to engage in domestic violence. What's more, a 2019 study discovered that even just using cannabis in the presence of a romantic partner is associated with increased experiences of intimacy. In my experience, sipping on cannabis drinks rather than alcohol made me feel a lot calmer and less reactive. I didn't perceive innocent remarks as attacks quite as often, and I had an easier time letting small annoyances roll off my back. In short, I was able to pick my battles, which any couple can tell you is so crucial in maintaining a healthy dynamic. Now that my experiment is over, I'm back to enjoying an occasional glass of wine or two, but the difference is I approach drinking more mindfully. The experience may have only lasted a month, but it left a lasting impression on me, and I still find myself reaching for cannabis beverages instead of alcohol, whether at social gatherings or relaxing solo after a stressful workday. My only regret? that it didn't start making the switch sooner. You ate cannabis. Yay. And just for that, I'm going to take a hit of the bowl. I know, right? <laughs> I feel like that uh, that weed, I feel very um, clear-minded, but I feel like I'm slurry in my speech. So I'm going to smoke some more. We're, we're going to get a little more Thanks. slurry. Give me some more. A little more, more slurry yeah. here. Sorry, everybody. We had to take a little smoke break. Mm-hmm. <laughs> cannabis consumers shop more by less. I've heard about this, that the... 
average ring now used to be 100 to 150 dollars has gone down to less than 100 in some states so let's find out why overall people are showing up to the shop more frequently but buying less these days customers are spending less per visit but they're visiting cannabis stores more frequently according to a new report by spring big uh that tracks the cannabis market across the united states and canada the report revealed a dip in the average consumer basket size a total spend by 9.5 percent and 9.8 percent respectively However, in-store visits and sales showed an increase on a, on a year-over-year basis and between the first and second quarter. In terms of product specifics, cannabis flower remained king. Flower power, flower power, uh, accounting for 54% of sales, followed by vapes at 22%, edibles at 12%, and concentrates at 8%. The data suggested a meaningful drop of 9.3% in sales of concentrates, both on a year-over-year -year basis and between quarters. The trends are not uniform across markets, however. Spring Big found that year-over-year -year, uh, retail trends in California were on par with the general North American patterns, but Colorado saw a drop in store visits and sales on a year-over-year -year basis in between quarters. I, I, I'll say this again about Colorado. They had a bunch of states around them that were not legal at all, and now uh, mostly all those states, I would say about 75% of those states now, are now legal in some way. So a big drop. Uh, in Maryland, which recently legalized recreational cannabis, there was a 13.1% increase in customers and a 10.2% rise in visits since the second quarter of last year, of course, because they went wreck. The state has been enjoying a nice Missouri-type surge in sales as legal adult use options provide some fresh air for the time being. We've talked about Missouri. 196 dispensaries that were all med flipped to rec across the whole entire state so you now have both in each store uh and you have surrounding states around them and their tax rates are low so people are going to missouri and flocking there the one thing about missouri right now is you cannot get flour they are so under 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 producing flour right now because the market flipped and they weren't ready it happens in a lot of states don't worry they'll catch up and you all have plenty of weed to buy uh, Q2 data reports how the economic state of cannabis industry has just affected consumers purchasing trends, said Jeffrey Harris, CEO of Spring Big. Um, it is especially interesting to see while basket size and overall spend has, has overall declined, retailers are seeing an increase in store visits. Spring Big will continue to equip the cannabis industry with tools to, to succeed in marketing and solutions and consumer data reports. That's kind of cool. Uh, according to Spring Big's data, Canada's Ontario uh, saw substantial year-over-year -year growth with increases in customers of 58.5% visits, 56.7% in sales, and 45.4% while also reporting above-average flower sales of 67%. The findings running along the same threads of uh, some other reports by sales tracking firm Headset, which posted that Ontario, uh, while store count has increased by approximately 40% over last year, average monthly sales per store have dropped by around 20%. Mm. Wow. The report suggests that sales growth seems to have come from a rise in the number of stores rather than the growing consumer demand. The same thing that's going to happen in Illinois. Same thing that's going to happen in Illinois, where other states open up, like you see in Missouri, and people are going over to Michigan because the taxes are so high, high here. But we are seeing an increase in stores like crazy. Like 20 new stores are going to open probably by the end of August. We're going to see 200 stores here by the end of the year, maybe even more. Craziness. And they're talking 500 stores here by 2025, the governor said he wants open. That's going to spread the thinness of everyone making the money they were making since early 2020 when it was only 75 dispensaries uh the report suggested that sales growth seems to have come from a rise in the number of stores rather than the growing consumer demand still talking about canada uh that presents a more sobering picture appears on the covid 19 pandemic created an inflated demand for cannabis that was unrealistic to maintain of course everybody got a bunch of free money so they went out and bought stuff they wanted and weed was one of them in addition, the oversupply of product in the country has appeared to shift strategies toward craft cannabis offerings. While sales totals in Canada have grown by 157% from May of 2020 to May 2023, if one shortens the horizon a bit, sales grew just 11.8% between 2022 and 2023, according to Headset. Crazy article. I had to read it because I read it and I liked it, the information on it. So um, this next article is huge because this is a debate. And it's the great terp debate on cannabis-derived terpenes or botanical <laughs> terpenes. And you are seeing where – and Mrs. Weeman is going to take over this article. And I have, I have some stuff to say on this, but here's what you see out in the market. Uh, 
You do not see any any uh, edibles, and maybe there might be a, a handful of brands that do use derived terpenes, mostly using botanical terpenes because of the, 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 the stabilization factors that I'm not 100% just knowledgeable on it, but am learning about this more and more. But you, when you buy a vape cart and they say they put botanical terpenes in there, you could taste that pungentness strength. And I don't always like the taste. It overpowers what I really want to taste. And I know distillate carts, they strip everything away so there's no taste at all. It's just straight THC. So they have to add stuff to make it taste a little bit better. Sometimes they overdo it, though. And it's like it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth on top of like sometimes you taste the metal from the from the mm -hmm. nickel. So, Mrs. Wee Man, tell us about this great terp debate. Yep, yep, yep. When it comes to cannabis flowers, one thing is true. They are pungent. Whether cannabis consumption is a daily ritual or a wafting scent from your neighbor's yard each evening, many people recognize the penetrating smell of pot. Most of these aromatics can be credited to cannabis-derived terpenes, a large group of compounds that grow naturally in common cannabis plants. Terpenes also grow in other herbs and flowers. Linalool is famously found in lavender. beta carophyllene can be found in black pepper. A large portion of essential oils are actually made up of terpenes. In cannabis plants, terps grow in complex configurations to create that unmistakable cannabis aroma. Terps are responsible for more than just smell and taste. They serve as a way for plants to communicate with their environment. These complex little molecules can even be found in some insects, like soldier beetles that emit terpenes from their frontal glands to fight attackers. Plants sometimes use terpenes as a defense, too. A plant being eaten by a deer, for example, might grow back with a new terpene that deer don't like, so the, the taste will inhibit further snacking. In the cannabis space, there's a belief that the compounds also play a role in product effects. However, there are other camps who stand behind botanical options for scalability and continuity. There are two camps when it comes to terpenes found in cannabis products like vape carts and edibles. Some consumers swear by cannabis-derived terpenes, while others preach on scalability and consistency of botanical-derived terps, and there's merit to both arguments. Many believe that cannabis terpenes are at the play in the entourage effect. This is a theory that cannabis effects are heightened when THC and CBD are joined by other organic compounds derived from cannabis. Cannabis flowers aroma is made of more than just terpenes alone, usually the result of very complex mix, mixture of terpenes, esters, ketones, and more aromatic compounds that create the overall effect, taste, and smell of a specific strain, said Nadav Ayal. CEO and co-founder of Israeli research firm and botanical terpene company Ibna Technologies. Some cannabis companies start with product formulation process with a distillate that has a high amount of one cannabinoid like THC. Companies like Ibna add botanical terpenes back in to build specific cannabis strains. This company extracts compounds from safely sourced plants and flowers like rosemary, lemons, and lavender. As Ila, e, I'm sorry, as Eyal mentioned, terpenes and cannabinoids are just two pieces of a puzzle. But all the pieces, esters, flavonoids, etc., are required to fully engage the entourage effect. Perhaps this is why some argue that cannabis-derived terpenes create a more high-quality cannabis product. Stizzy is one cannabis company that only uses cannabis-derived terpenes in its vape pods. The brand grows house strains and uses an extraction process to preserve the naturally occurring terpenes. Product development director Jared Lamborn recently connected with Green State, and he said, Cannabis-derived terpenes are taken directly from the cannabis plant, producing a taste that's more natural and true to the flavor of cannabis flower. Many of our customers want to taste the plant in their smoke experience, which is why we produce pods using cannabis-derived terpenes and reference the terminology on the packaging so people know exactly what they're getting. Many consumers believe there is an experiential difference between cannabis and botanically-derived products. This nuance could come down to formulation. 
Eall is confident that the botanical experience matches or is even more enjoyable and consistent than cannabis-derived options. Brands just need a complete range of safe, safely harvested and carefully formulated terpenes. And he goes on to say, if done properly, properly, botanically derived terpenes will usually have a more fresh, crisp, and appealing smell than cannabis derived. Cannabis derived terpenes are often being degraded in the extracting process and contain more oxidized metabolites than botanical terpenes do, explained Yell. And then he continued. If botanically derived formulation includes the full range of terpenes, then the final user experience of botanical can be the same with better consistency over time. Consistency seems to be the main benefit of formulating with botanical terps. Cannabis plants can be finicky by growing differently or producing a slightly altered terpene profile from harvest to harvest. Translating that into a product that promises the same experience time after time can be difficult. Eall asserts that botanical terpenes can solve this continuity problem. The chemical profiles in cannabis plants can vary based on a range of factors, including growing conditions and harvest times. When extracted as a whole from the cannabis plant, these will have a different composition from batch to batch, said Eall. This consistency is crucial for cannabis brands looking to reach scalability and have control of their products' aroma, flavor, and effects for the long term. Scalability is one is the second advantage of having a reliable terpene product. Scaling up the production of vape pods and carts made with cannabis-derived terpenes may require a brand to expand cultivation and extraction pro- operations, but a company using botanical terpenes would only need to purchase more from its wholesale provider. The investment is much smaller for brands using botanicals. Though botanical terpenes are touted as scalable and reliable, the die-hard cannabis-derived fans will probably remain steadfast in their preferences. That'd be me. <laughs> as the international cannabis industry develops, research-focused terpene companies like Ibna will continue expanding botanical terpene offerings. A high concentration of terpenes can lead to more flavor and could even bolster the coveted entourage effect. But a heavy hand with botanical terpenes creates an overt flavor that's hard to stomach. With safety-focused, science-backed botanical options, it may be possible to craft cannabis products that consumers love. However, cannabis-derived products aren't going anywhere. Much like the world of beer, there will always be a place for craft brews alongside commercial operations. Yeah, I mean, it is a debate. You know, I, I, I talk to people about it and hear, you know, about the whole cannabis terpenes versus, listen, just smoke it then. <laughs> you know, right. if you wanted to get the cannabis terpenes, you know. It's kind of weird, though. It's almost like they take, they'll take a cannabis strain, right, analyze it, laboratory testing. They know how much THC, CBD, maybe CBN is in there. They're going to know how much linalool and all of these different terpenes, right? They're going to yep. know all this, the whole profile. So then essentially they're going to take their distillate that has stripped out all of those terpenes and extra cannabinoids, right? Out, except for the THC. Just THC. And then they're going to, like the recipe for GG4 is two drops of linalool and three drops of beta carophyllene and 10 drops of CBN. That's basically, they're going to have these formulated recipes for strains. So it's completely, con- is, I'm, that's a question. <laughs> oh, it's a question? <laughs> Oh, I thought you. I, I no, I don't you, know enough to make oh. a statement. <laughs> I'm asking you: Is that really what what it's going to come down to? Like, the, they're or already doing is that's already? Well, like, I mean, there's a formula in the, for in a the, strain. In the dis, a lot of the distillate carts, they're adding botanical terpenes back in now. But are they just like? I don't throwing know. shit together. No, stirring no, the pot I think, I, and no, then writing no, it think, down. I think they're pl- placing it to the effects that maybe people want for that strain that they used okay. or distillate that they're making. So it's more like or a maybe prescription. A fla- maybe the flavor profile they might be going for mm-hmm. uh, to make it taste better. Um, I've I've smoked straight distillate, and it, it's not the greatest taste. It's not a, the worst taste, but it's not the greatest taste, yeah. you know. Uh, but knowing that they can take the terpenes from that plant and mirror it to the, uh, the distillate carts, 
I mean, that's something special. I don't know how much how much they actually truly add, you know. But like I said, I've smoked some some distillate lately, uh, carts, which I'm not a huge fan of. But I've someone who's given me one to try, and all I taste is heavy handed terps. I mean, it's like over. and they're natural. They're coming from plants. Yeah, they're just coming from different yeah. I've plants. seen bottles of the liquids. I mean, you have they're synthetic. You, no, they take a, as well. Yeah, or, there is, yeah. but they take it up right from the plants. How or do you f- know if your product has a synthetic? Or I, a you botanical, don't. like you don't. Hmm. So, but I know a lot of companies out there use true that come from that they're not synthetic at all. They're true. Well, you know it's going to get there. You know it's going to get there. Of that, course, it's cheaper. Easier. Well, and f- like for med- maybe for the medical world, for the FDA to put their stamp on it and let doctors prescribe it, it might become a completely synthetic pro- product. Pro- possibly, isn't that weird? Yeah, that'd be terrible. <laughs> well. That's all right. Just doctor prescribe it for me, and then I'm gonna go grow my right. own plant, and I'm just gonna consume my plant and refill the prescription and not take it. Right. Yeah. I guess. I mean, we'll see what happens. Something like that. Yeah. I'm really high right now. You are really high. <laughs> <laughs> that you got Am I you rambling? Yeeted. Got you yeeted. Uh, new congressional amendment would end marijuana tests for federal job applicants and encourage psychedelic research. That's cool. New York regulators vote to allow marijuana farmer markets while nearly doubling the number of provisional retail licenses. Cool. Uh, 2.7 million New York residents are regular marijuana users. Dang. That's a lot. Number of federal cannabis prisoners have decreased by 61% over the past five years. Sweet. South Dakota Police Commission approves officer applicants with cannabis records. They're being forgiven. So, and it was two law enforcement officers seeking certification were recently forgiven for their past cannabis use. Not that they're still using cannabis. It's just they've been forgiven. Really? (laughs) Senate Committee Chairman says uh, marijuana banking bill actually won't get a vote this summer. Come on. Really? You're surprised? Despite uh, his goal, uh, some lobbyists report. Are you surprised? I'm not. I, 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 you know when I'll be surprised when it's fucking finally voted in. That's when I'll be surprised. So just he- keep on reading this over the last ten years that the banking thing has been going on. I'm not surprised. Whatever. Uh, you know what? Some. I, okay. So I'm. I'm gonna. I'm change the subject for just a slight second, and we're going a little long here, but we had a lot to say today, and we still got more to say. But I was. I got this article. I'm gonna read about the Teamsters, but. Across the top of this crane, Chicago business news, Rocky Wirtz died. Oh, really? The the, uh, the Blackhawks chairman and Wirtz Beverage, mm-hmm. and he big died, name in Chicago, a huge name. I mean, he's the he's the chairman of the Blackhawks. I mm-hmm. mean, brought dynasty to this to this city, and uh, but he died. And he's only 70. 70. Wow. I mean, that just proves right there all the money in the world can't save you. And you can't take it with you. Hmm. So at, at 70, and don't get me wrong, he probably lived a fantastic life with the kind of money he was able to have and, and being a, the Blackhawks owner and what, he, what uh, jobs he's given in Chicago all these years. He traveled probably aimlessly around the world. Who knows? But all that and, and, and more he did, but dead at 70. Sucks. Mm-hmm. Just to, I mean, just to die at 70. You know, and you have you have everything that I guess you could say you wanted, and then all of a sudden you can't take it with you. Everything you worked for. So hopefully he enjoyed his life. Uh, Teamsters, though, reached a deal with another Chicago cannabis company. I'm going to say something to all you again about unions. Stop joining unions that don't know anything or care about anything about cannabis. The Teamsters is basically their union best organizing for trucking and warehousing industry. What do they know about cannabis? That's the frustration part for me when I see these unions, when you should be creating one big union, 500,000 members who work in the cannabis industry. I'm talking about sales. I'm talking about, I'm talking about dispensaries, cultivation companies. I'm even talking about partnering with the, 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 the dispensary owners, partnering with them, working with them, working with the cultivation owners, coming together as one big cannabis union. And working all of it out together. Isn't this supposed to be a community? Don't join Teamsters and don't, don't give a shit. Don't join these other unions that don't know shit about cannabis. Form your own. Come together. Enough about that. 
Uh, that was a big statement I don't coming care. from the south side of Chicago. I don't care. <laughs> the teachers are great what they did for the trucking industry, and I'm not taking anything away about unions. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, what do these unions know about cannabis and the cannabis culture and the cannabis community? Because there's no standing operation procedures for fucking cannabis. Never forget that. There's no standard operation procedure for culture. Okay? And they're great what they did for their for their trucking and I'm not taking they fought for workers' rights and all that stuff. I'm not taking anything away from any union. What I'm taking away from is you and the cannabis industry start your own union. Somebody please start it. Make it right for the cannabis industry. I can go on, but I won't. Florida Marijuana Initiative could generate $431.3 million million in annual state revenue. Don't you think they want to, like, make that fucking legal there in that state? Recreational? But here's the crazy thing. A a friend of mine in Jacksonville actually sent me a picture, DM me a picture of, of this. A large amount of cannabis washes ashore on, the, on Neptune Beach in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm not talking about just a little. I'm talking about it wasn't seaweed on that beach. It was fucking <laughs> buds across the beach in Neptune Beach. And he, t- he snapped a picture and, and, and put it on his Instagram. Thanks, my friend Stu down in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, my gosh. Crazy. And a lot of them said it was right. But they're finding bales upon bales across Florida right now. And sharks are eating cocaine bales, and now they're going crazy. <laughs> they're eating boats and ships and just going nuts right now, swimming faster than fucking man ever thought possible. Don't give fucking sharks cocaine. Jeez. <laughs> Cannabis testing declines as businesses adapt to widespread legalization. Good. I don't think anybody should be tested for cannabis. What you do on your own time is what you do in your own time. Uh Possibly contaminated marijuana vape, says possibly. Cartridges recalled from 76 Michigan pot shops. Ooh, bad. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully it's only possibly. <laughs> uh, Viva Pot Vegas. Viva Pot Vegas. Las Vegas Strip about to solve a big problem. Viva Pot Vegas. Let me tell you something. You cannot, there is no dispensaries on the can- on Las Vegas Strip. They're all off the beaten path. So there's going to be uh, lounges, though, are going to start there, and it's pretty cool. They're going to offer some cannabis consumption lounges off the beaten path so we can go and get stoned since you can't get stoned on the strip. And just like – but it, it kind of like really weird because you, you've been to Vegas. You can drink on the strip, right, as yeah. long as you have it in a cup, yep. Yep. right? Yeah, you can walk. so weird you can't smoke cannabis on the strip. Weird. How risky is it to send weed through the mail, Mrs. Weed Man? Yeah. I know people – I've gotten it mailed to me. I mean, I, I'm not saying anything to anybody else, but I have got mailed to me, and I was nervous. Mm-hmm. This is like a long one, and I know that we're running long, so I'll try to abbreviate where I can, but uh, this is interesting. So if, like me, you live in one of the country's 22 majestic recreational states, you may have received a call from a friend living in one of your, our sad, dry states. I have, and it sounds like this. Uh, could you like maybe just drop me like, you know, a little in the mail, not even a quarter, <laughs> just a little something, something. <laughs> I wanted to do my pal a solid, of course, but not enough to trade my carefully calibrated work life balance for a prison phone and plexiglass. I wondered at a time when church going moms utter the word bud tender with a straight face, when cannabis is advertised on towering roadside billboards Just how dicey is it to send a little weed to a friend in need? So I decided to find out. I began assessing the odds by looking at the numbers. The United States Postal Service employs about 1,200 postal inspectors to hunt for suspicious packages, which might sound like a small army until you consider that the Postal Service processes 23.8 million packages per day. FedEx does 16.5 million. And so, while Postal Service investigations led to 2,100 drug related arrests last year, you can easily imagine that plenty of mild mannered, weed bearing boxes skeeter on through unnoticed. In fact, when I spoke with cannabis growers, folks who literally bank on their shipments arriving unnoticed, 
they told me that they only send their weed via the United States, United States Postal Service. Why? Because if someone at FedEx or UPS senses something even slightly suspicious, they can immediately tear into a package. And they put it in their pocket and they go <laughs> home happy. <laughs> the USPS, on the other hand, requires a federal warrant based on probable cause, which is a proper pain in the ass. When I asked Michael Martin, a veteran postal inspector, what makes a package seem suspicious, he was understandably cagey. In order to preserve the effectiveness of our investigative techniques, I can't really talk about what goes into identifying a parcel that makes it suspicious, Damn. he told me. But Martel gamely confirmed a few red flags that others in the cannabis trade had mentioned to me. Packages without a return address, those that are sealed with too much tape, or carry excessive postage or exude an odor. Other grower-supplied gotchas using a fake return address, a non-existent return zip code, and a name not associated with the recipient's address. Red flags and gotchas aside, it's worth noting that the Postal Service does not need a warrant to x-ray a package. And in fact, Martel told me, some mail, especially mail traveling through larger cities, is routinely x-rayed. Writing do not x-ray on a package instantly makes it suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> some secrets of a former dealer. Back when Luke Carlin was a teenager, years before he started his successful cannabis education YouTube channel and consulting business, he may or may not have dealt a shit ton of weed and may or may not have used the mail to service his clients. Successful cannabis by mail types, Carlin explained to me, take their step-by-step -step process seriously. First, he says, they slide the flour into a Ziploc bag and then lightly swab the bag with an alcohol wipe to reduce residue and odor. Then they vacuum seal the Ziploc bag at least once, but often twice. The vacuum sealer, Carlin says, is the core of it all. Next up, the zipped vacuum sealed package is placed into a black smell-proof Mylar bag. Carlin emphasizes the importance of not packaging the box while sitting in a room in which weed has been smoked because the post office, he says, tests for residue. Using a disposable glove uh, eliminates the transfer of any residue that happens to be on the packer's hands. The box itself is key. The pros use only new, clean boxes and reach for the smallest in which the bundle can comfortably fit, adding insulation so that the contents don't shuffle around. The post office priority mailboxes often get the nod because they aren't conspicuous and postage is standardized, so there's less room for error. With respect to the outside of the box, Carlin says regular weed shippers keep it simple. They go crazy with the security on the inside of the package, but they want the outside low-key so it blends in. At the post office, cannabis senders pay only with cash. And with respect to sending edibles, the pre-packaged kind, not the homemade cookie kind, Carlin believes there's very little to worry about, especially if the gummies or chocolate get packaged inside a Mylar bag. On the receiving end of the package, Carlin preaches the gospel of plausible de deniability and says that the, recipient, the recipients wait 48 hours before opening a parcel. If the Postal Service or police come knocking, you simply hand them the unopened box and say, I don't know anything about it. Given the millions of packages streaming through the Postal Service, I asked Inspector Mar Martell, how the relatively few postal inspectors prioritize their prodding, poking, and sniffing. And Martel told me, man hours and investigative priorities are focused on the dangerous substances killing Americans. Everything from toxins, toxins like anthrax to fentanyl, meth, and opiates. He also mentioned explosives, scorpions, and snakes. But that's another story. <laughs> Martel knows of what he speaks because before he became an information officer for the Postal Service, he spent eight years as a boots-on-the-ground inspector and once opened a package containing a full kilo of cartel cocaine. Martel wouldn't say that the Postal Service shrugs off small-weight cannabis packages, but he did say if it's not something that would be prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office, I think we would lean more towards seizure and destruction than a criminal investigation. 
it's worth noting that the Postal Service is, like everyone else, improving its computer-assisted predictive modeling practices. By combining individual package data with historical seizure data, we can develop models that proactively target suspicious packages. And so, until the federal government legalizes cannabis on a national level, the cat-and-mouse game between weed senders and the postal inspectors will continue. With inspectors turning to advanced tools and tech, and the cannabis crowd cooking up new tricks to blend in and slip through the cracks. So, will mailing 50 bucks worth of dispensary bought smartly packaged cannabis end up with you Googling bail bondsman near me? My guess, <laughs> likely not. Am I going to risk it? Also likely not. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> I've mailed edibles. I mean, I have. Not it happens. You. It does. Sometimes people want a little bit of the, 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 the good stuff, the yep. good, good. The good, good. <laughs> Especially somebody, some people I know that have not felt well and mm -hmm. needed medicine. So, International news, the European country just legalized medical cannabis. And guess who it was? The Albanian parliament has legalized cannabis for medical and industrial use. Last Friday reported ABC News. Congratulations, Albanian. Al Albania, congrats, congrats, congrats. Now go wreck. Are Canadian failures uh, harboring uh, things to come for the U.S. operators? Let's give you a couple of examples. Cannabis supply issues strike again. Oversupply is taking down a publicly traded giant in Canada's cannabis market. We've talked about the oversupply, how much they destroyed last year. Crazy. Are, are we repeating the same mistakes? This is not a Canadian phenomenon. The same thing is happening in the United States as large MSOs have also installed capacity in newer state markets, particularly in medical states. They are getting prepared for wreck. So they're building monstrosity uh, uh, of cultivation and buying as many dispensaries as they can, and it's just going to be just garbage. <laughs> Common issues despite different markets, oversupply and undersupply issues in regulated cannabis markets, the price of legal cannabis products, especially relative to the illicit market, consumers' access to retail cannabis. So, uh, I mean, the whole country is legal in Canada, so it's just different right now. Federal legalization, when that happens, it's going to be a massacre here in the United States. It's going to be ugly. And I was just reading some articles. I think I'm going to talk about them in the next episode about the waste and how much water, and I've talked about this before, about waste and water and resources and agriculture and how much is being overdone. It takes a few gallons of water. Let's just say like anywhere between like four to six gallons of water in some cultivation a day that they're watering their plants, each plant. Not like four to six ounces, four to six gallons of water. The cannabis plant drinks, okay? Especially if you're using cocoa, and you're watering your plants two or three times a day. If you're using soil, it's a little bit different. But a lot of a lot of cultivators are using cocoa because you can grow faster, grow smaller, meaning smaller. You, I mean, I seen like one gallon cocoa core, and they just they got like lines of nutrients lines and water lines, like four to six of them going right into that plant, and they're on a time cycle. And there's a lot of water when you're talking about a thousand plants per room, fifteen hundred plants per room. So it's a lot of water, you know, and we waste a lot of weed. So with all that water, um, you know, it's sad because water, we need water. <laughs> so uh, Amsterdam wants to change its image. They're not letting people smoke on any of the cannabis can canal cruises. They're not, they're, they're party, party tourists aren't welcome. They're not letting people smoke in the red light district anymore. So they're really trying to change some stuff there after they were the leader like people like went to Amsterdam just to go to the coffee shops and the smoke because it was f nice. You weren't, you know, so I don't know, Amsterdam, don't fuck it up, you know. The biggest cannabis company in Latin America is in Puerto Rico called Pritch, P-R-I-C-H. They have a 420,000 square feet cultivation. And I went out, I went and watched the YouTube video of it and it's huge, big. I mean, it's a huge center and uh, 420,000 square feet and all the, it's being used, the whole, the whole facility. It's crazy. 3,000 people hospitalized in Ireland amid warning over cannabis products. Now, just so all you that are reading this, it's not 
cannabis, it's synthetic THC that people are getting sick on. So that just proves a point. You 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 are letting your your humans in your country buy synthetic products and and ending up in the hospital when you can legalize cannabis and let people home grow and grow their own medicine so they know where they're getting it from, let caregivers start over there and let people give medicine to the people that need it so they don't have to get it off the streets synthetically and end up in a hospital. So U.S. supermodel arrested. Who was it, Mrs. Wee Man? Yeah. Uh, Gigi. Gigi? Gigi? It could be I, Gigi. It could be, I think it's Gigi. She, I think she's Gigi. 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 It doesn't really matter. Hadid. I Yeah. Gigi. 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 <laughs> you have a cousin, Gigi. That's what's screwing you I know. Up. That's what's messing with me. Uh, she was arrested in the Caribbean for marijuana position. American supermodel <clears throat> Hadid. 28, was arrested in the Grand Cayman Islands after marijuana was found in her luggage, media from Grand Cayman reported. The model and influencer who identifies as Palestinian-American was found with marijuana in her luggage while customs officials were processing her at Owen Roberts International Airport on the island last week. She was reportedly charged along with Leah McCartney, McCarthy, who is also an American model and influencer, while the two were traveling. Local media reported that Hadid and McCarthy arrived via private aircraft from a location in the United States. Though the quantity of weed was not large, it was enough to have each of them fined $1,000 after being taken into detention and processed. Hadid reportedly just a few days later left. Uh, Cannabis is not legal for recreational use in the Cayman Islands, while the use of CBD for people with proper licenses from qualified doctors is allowed. Hadid's U.S. medical card was not recognized by authorities in Grand Cayman. Man, that sucks. Yeah. Tony Bennett passed away at 96 years old on July 20th. Rest in peace. But he said that all drug should have been legalized in 2012 after Whitney Houston died. So, and he had a, a stint with drug use and almost killed him. He was saved by his second wife, and you talked about it in his memoir, In the Good Life. Uh, but he was said in Hollywood, it's everywhere, and every party he ever went to, drugs flowed. But he said, let's legalize it. And what he really meant was pot, reefer, herb, grass is a popular among the jazz cats, both male and female, as the above photo with him and, and Peggy Lee attest is a photo on this article. Bennett was one of them and certainly ahead of his time. He suffered for his hard drug use and knew weed wasn't the problem. One of the many posts on Facebook paying tribute to Bennett refers to his uh, his, his uh, marijuana use. Um, so he was an advocate for it. He liked it. He knew it wasn't a problem. So basically, you might call it the good life. Rest in peace, Tony Bennett. Man, you were a great singer. Man, that jazz thing he did, man, he was smooth, smooth, smooth. He was. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Weedman, that's the end of the show. Yep. Got anything else to say? Um... I, yeah, the yeet f- made my brain not work so well. <laughs> Started uh, off really clear, and it went downhill from there. But was, I'm ready to smoke some more. Smoke some more. Have a great week, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy life, as Mr. Weedman says. Go on, Mr. Weedman, say it. Everybody out there in the world, we love you. Enjoy your life each and every day as you know how to do it. Go out there and enjoy the world. It's out there for you. You can do it. I know sometimes it's hard. I know it. I know it. But you can go out there and enjoy your life the best way you know how and you can do it. So we love you out there in the world. As Paulie always says, smoke smart. Puff, puff, and away. Puff, puff, puff. Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t-shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome long-lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. 8 Decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable.